evening, everybody. Uh, it's a wonderful location, Aquinas College. Um, a few of the old priests and myself play tennis in the courts here every Monday morning. So I knew my way here t tonight very, very easily. Uh, I often tell people they play tennis of a Monday morning in case they think I've, I've died and uh, uh, since I've retired, vanished into obscurity and perhaps uh, of, um, uh, meet, meet the Lord. Uh, I hope I meet the Lord daily, but not in the way they think. So the Lord has given me a little bit more life and I'm very, very happy to be a retired Archbishop to uh, uh, still be, uh, to respond to whatever requests are made of me uh, because the position of Archbishop is an office in the church and a very important one but the call to serve as a priest is, is uh, not necessarily that of an Archbishop that call still remains and therefore I try as much as I can to continue to respond to that call of our Lord to follow him in the ordained ministry. Tonight, um, this is the opening address for the Congress, uh, which is entitled Faith and Grace and Divine Blessings. The bishops of Australia asked that this be called the Year of Grace, and so it started as the Year of Grace. Then the Holy Father, without consulting us, the Pope, said, it's the year of faith. And so it's now the year of grace and faith and divine blessings always. So it's a privilege to come here and speak to you. I don't give a very oratorical presentation. I just talk. And I hope you don't mind that. I talk about the things that mean a lot to me. I talk tonight about the things I hope mean a lot to you too. And if anything um, I say is used by the Holy Spirit to touch your hearts, then I give thanks to Almighty God. This Congress is uh, an experience, a spiritual experience of joy, of prayer, of silence, of praise. It's uh, an experience in which we are docile to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. It is a time when we are docile to the Word of God and we listen. It's a time when we renew our commitment to be like all those disciples of Jesus when he walked this earth, a true follower, a true f a disciple of Jesus. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit as he stood at the, on the bank of the River Jordan, was baptized in the baptism of repentance by John the Baptist. And the sign of the Holy Spirit's presence was the dove above his head. And the voice of, the, of his father was heard to say, this is my son, the one I love. Listen to him. Tonight we listen. Just as Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, so in baptism and confirmation, we were anointed by the Holy Spirit, and then that anointing uh, deepens and increases every time that we are open to the coming down and the work in our hearts of the Holy Spirit. And I well, pray tonight that we may remain docile to the Spirit's promptings, that we remain docile to the Word of God as we listen and let it change us like a two-edged sword cutting away the dross, the sinfulness, the laziness, the selfishness and leaving the divine presence pure and, and, uh, re and present within us. So this experience of docility to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is firstly personal. It must be personal. It must touch us deeply. 
It must change us. We are sinful people and I'm with you there. But we know that being sinful people, Jesus has done so much for us and has given his life for our salvation and sent us the Holy Spirit to bring us to the Father. So that sinfulness, in a way, is a source of grace because it allows us to be changed, to allow the Holy Spirit to work within us, to allow Jesus to take us with him on his journey and, receive, and at the end of our life to return us to the Father. So our docility to the Holy Spirit must be personal. It is not an act. It's not something we put on for others. We're not to be pharisaical about this and do it to gain honor and praise from others. It must be deeply personal and meant. But it is also, as members of the church, the body of Christ, that we seek to follow Jesus and be led by the Spirit. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are brothers and sisters under the fatherhood of God. And we are together in our journey. And that togetherness we feel in these days of the con Congress. If it is community, then it will affect society deeply. I mentioned, I'll come on to that in a second, I mentioned docility to the Word of God. One of the things that I tried very hard to, to advance during my years as Archbishop was love for the Word of God, the written Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament and its fulfillment in the New Testament. Because the, in my experience, the Word of God was revered um, when I was a child. We heard it on Sunday at Mass. I don't think there was a Bible in my house when I was a child. I can't remember it. Certainly didn't uh, become part of our daily prayer. But we did pray as a, a family. I lived a charmed life. We'd say evening prayers together. And uh, after the Father Peyton Rosary Crusade, and some of you are old enough to remember that, we said the Rosary every night. But the Word of God, we revered it, but we didn't use it as a source of prayer. For some time the Holy Father has asked us, the various popes of recent years, have asked us to listen to the Word of God, make it our own, make it part of our prayer life, make it part of our very existence. It always was in the church. It was so. We read the fathers of the church and they're quoting scripture all the time. We read the great scholastics of the church, the scholastic philosophers, the theologians uh, of the Middle Ages, and they were seeped in the, in the Word of God. Uh, even before printing, there were, ha there were copies of the Bible available and the theologians had access to them. They were all handwritten. With printing, they disseminated everywhere. Then a couple of strange things happened. Uh, with the Reformation, the big Protestant split. Many of the Protestants were saying to the Catholics, you're not biblical, your church is not biblical, you've got all this apparatus that is not in the Bible, you're not biblical. And uh, there was a big fight back that we are, and so we searched the origins of the sacraments and so forth in the Bible. But that was being said. And they said, you don't, your people don't read the Bible. And there was some truth in that. Then we came to the 19th century and we had the German biblical scholars, great scholars, who went too far. They weren't Catholic scholars in the main. They started to look at the Bible and look for sources of the Bible and began to question everything. 
they began to take the supernatural out of the Bible. They began to explain away the miracles. The Old Testament ones like the parting of the Red Sea, the New Testament miracles like the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. And they said, that's just uh, a, a sort of an, um, uh, a, a manner of figure of speech. These things really didn't happen. They are only put there to increase our faith that God is with us. And uh, they did terrible damage. So people began to doubt. You know, began to doubt about the origin of humanity, about the truth of the Bible, um, and uh, see it just as a collection of, of sayings, of um, stories, and uh, without encouraging us to believe that they were true. That gave rise to a 20th century uh, uh, energetic spurt in the Catholic Church to send the theologians back into Scripture to defend the words of the, and the traditions of the Church in the first few centuries that the Word of God was what was forming us. And they did, and they did a marvelous job. And so last century we have seen um, many, many Catholic theologians come to the uh, top of their, their field in biblical scholarship. Did it seep down to the level of the people? Not easily, not easily. Then the liturgical renewal when we took more seriously the homily of the Mass and its connection with the Word of God. And so many priests uh, took uh, the trouble to read, to look at the various resources and to try to present the truths of the faith based on the scripture readings and try to apply them to the, to the lives of the people. And that was a good movement. Did it popularize the use, the use of the Bible? Not all that much, but it was the beginning. Many, many parishes started scripture study groups. When I decided to take some action about all this, I encouraged these scripture groups. I encouraged the various um, scripture courses that were around the world, many of them in print. This is... Um, and now many of them online, and lots, lots, of, lots and lots of parishes are now using those scripture studies. They're not just academic studies, they delve within the, the Word of God and try to see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. It's not just a matter of the mind of studying, it's a matter of the heart in receiving and being transformed and changed. And that movement is still going on. I went to our seminary at St. Charles and uh, uh, yes, set up the policy of, the, of every student going for the priesthood to have some experience in the Holy Land. To perhaps the, the two years before ordination or even the year of ordination, even for two weeks um, concentrated course, that they would go to the Holy Land, to one of the centers there, in order to be seeped with the Word of God and get passionate and get fired up with enthusiasm and be in the places where Jesus walked and talked and come back. And that would make a difference in their ministry. And it has worked. Many of the priests who have been overseas, even for that brief course, have come back fired up and said, we've got to give this to the people. Come and let's sit around the table together and pray. Let us sit around the table together with the Holy Scriptures and see how they can feed us spiritually. It's, it's having wonderful results. I don't know whether that policy will continue, but I'm no longer the boss, but uh, I think the fruits are there. I went to the education uh, office and uh, said, look, I've read through all the guidelines, 
There's very little about scripture, very little. Let's have a, a far greater input in two ways. Um, information about Holy Scripture so that the young ones growing up will be familiar with the Bible, can take the Bible and know where to go in the Bible, just those ordinary things from an early age. But also, the second thing was to use the Bible in the teaching of the faith. Because the whole of the faith is, comes from the Bible itself. Now the first one has been done. There was a pretty tough course, if you take it very seriously, in those guidelines in, in secondary years um, for uh, religious education on the Bible. Less successful was I to ask that the teaching be drawn from the Bible. Often quotes are used after the teaching is given to, to refer them back to the Bible, but I wanted a sort of a revolution. <laughs> start with the Bible, start with the Jesus' words, start with the um, scripture, Old Testament, New, and see how our faith has come out of it, how our teaching of baptism has come out of it, how our teaching about penance and the forgiveness of sin has come out, out of it. That hasn't been done yet, but the seed has been sown, and please God, one day it will, will, will happen. But I also asked that um, the teachers themselves have the opportunity to go to the Holy Land, because I knew that if they did, oh, it would transform their teaching of the faith and their teaching of the Bible. It would become personal. They'd say, I've been there. They'd hear the stories of the um, transfiguration. I've been on that mountain. They see uh, where Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee. I've seen the spot. And uh, they started to send half a dozen teachers at the uh, education office expense to the Holy Land. And when they came back, they were so enthusiastic that they repeated it the following year with another six teachers and others who wanted to join them at their own expense. And so in March, the 5th of March, I will be talking to, I suppose, about 20 teachers who are going off to the Holy Land to do a month's course at the Tantua Institute um, on the Bible. And they will go out and they'll... Um, They'll go to various archaeological sites, they'll hear the history behind the stories in the Bible, and they will hear from very, very expert teachers um, how to understand the Bible, how to apply it to their lives. Most of all, they will breathe in the atmosphere of Jerusalem and of Galilee and of all those holy places. I've been there three times now, and it was after... Uh, my visit there in 2007, that I was so fired up, I wrote that little book, Living Biblically. And uh, tonight before coming here, I opened it up and read a chapter. And I thought, that's not too bad, who wrote that? So it is, it is me, if you want to know how I think, that's me. Because I read it again, that particular chapter, and it's exactly the way I think and see and, and feel about those particular items. It's how to follow Jesus. Um, so I, uh, I can recommend it to you if you can find a copy. It's now out of print, but if there's a demand, it'll, there'll be another printing. We've got rid of 10,000 already. Um, so... Um, You know, the, Bi the Holy Land was not a friendly place for Christians for a long time. After the sack of Jerusalem by the Roman legion, when they laid siege to D Jerusalem, sitting up on Mount Scopus, looking down, no food or water could get into the town until they were all so weak, the Roman soldiers came and, uh, and there was a massacre. Um, uh, there was, and the temple, beautiful temple was destroyed. 
there was an exodus again from Jerusalem. Roman Empire wasn't a friendly place for, for Jews nor for Christians. And uh, Jerusalem was laid waste. And it was only in the 6th, 7th century that the Persians came and took it over as part of their kingdom. And there were, then it stayed like that for a few centuries. They built two mosques right on the, the Dome of the Rock, right on where the temple was before. Two, two great mosques. One of them you'll see if you go there. It's, it's a great golden dome. It's beautiful. And it's there since the 7th century. And there's another mosque in the corner. That, um, that means that the temple will probably never be built again unless there's, there's a huge war. Um, it was in the 12th, sorry, the end of the 11th century to the end of the 12th century that the Crusaders took Jerusalem just for a hundred years from about uh, 1100 to 1200, uh, roughly. During those hundred years, Christians went there in droves to go to the Holy Land to make pilgrimages and uh, that had a huge influence on the church uh, wherever it was. And then the, um, uh, the various Islamic forces took it over again and the Ottoman Empire made it part of their empire and it was only in the 20th century that uh, uh, it became, uh, uh, in the First World War, after the uh, defeat of, well, it was hardly a defeat of Turkey, but after uh, Turkey's power was overthrown, the power of the, the Ottomans, that Jerusalem and the Holy Land uh, was given to, as a protectorate to Britain. And we know the history since then, the creation of the State of Israel and the eternal conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. There's still not peace there. When we think of Jerusalem, uh, we think of it with sadness. Because even Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he said. You who stoned the prophets, I wanted to gather you to myself as a hen gathers her chickens and you would not. You did not know the day of your visitation. He wept over Jerusalem. And many have wept over Jerusalem ever since. When the temple was destroyed um, in the time of the Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah the prophet wept over Jerusalem. And if you look at his uh, lamentations. He talked about Jerusalem as an abandoned city and the temple destroyed. And uh, that those lamentations have been set to Gregorian music in their Latin form. And they're absolutely beautiful and used to be sung every year uh, during Holy Week uh, on the Wednesday night. Uh, and in 1991, I think it was the first time I spoke here at, um, at Flame Congress. And I remember that I sang. I haven't sung since, but I sang at that Congress. So tonight with your um, uh, agreement, I propose to sing again. What I want to do is just sing a few of the bars of the Gregorian setting of the lamentation of Jeremiah over Jerusalem. Uh, just the, the last ending of every lamentation goes, Jerusalem, Jeru Jerusalem, convertere a dominum deum tuum. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, convert back to the Lord your God. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Convertere ad dominum Deum nostrum. Hallelujah. That's the atmosphere 
of those beautiful lamentations. Um, we've um, lost that. We've lost so many things. But um, they'll come back, I'm sure. You can't lose anything as beautiful as that. I've gone off the track a bit, but what I am saying is that there, there's been a great effort that I've been pleased to, to sort of push to get the Holy Scripture to the level of the people. Now, I'm speaking here to the converts. I'm speaking here to people who know exactly what I'm saying because you do love Holy Scripture. You quote the Old Testament, you quote the New Testament again and again. You draw your nourishment and your inspiration from the words of Holy Scripture so that you are part of this revival of the use of Scripture in our ordinary families around the diocese, around Australia and around the world that they can find there the Word of God and that they listen intently so that that Word of God may touch and change their hearts as the Word of God has touched and changed your hearts. So I think there will be some lasting results of all those efforts. There are others too, but we don't need to talk about them. Um, and I hope that that continues into the future. It's so important that we are, be a biblical church, a biblical church. You are also able to discern not just uh, being part of something larger than yourself, the body of Christ, apart from your own personal journey and conversion, being part of the body of Christ, but having a vocation, a call to do something about all that I'm saying. And you have that vocation. The Holy Father said recently that uh, the church is under attack in so many ways. The church is under attack because for justified reasons because of the sins of many of her leaders. Comparatively, very few in number, but they've had a huge impact. And you know what I'm talking about? Those that have shamed us all by their abusive children. So we've been attacked for that. And I, for one, simply have to bow my head and say it should never have happened, and we're sorry. But he said we're also being attacked because of our beliefs. Because we believe in the dignity of the human person. And abortion is so frequent that the dignity of the human person in the womb is not being acknowledged that we stand against that. And we stand for the dignity of every human person, old, young, in the womb, out in the world. We are being attacked too because of our teaching on human sexuality. We say that human sexuality is a gift from God, that it is sanctified by the sacrament of matrimony, that its purpose is, to, is about love and procreation and continuation of the human race and uh, unity with God so that the very relationship between husband and wife should be like the relationship between, ship between Jesus and the church. Very high, noble teaching about human sexuality. We're being attacked because of that. We're being attacked also um, because uh, we value human life and we see life as a gift from God. And so we're opposed to anything that demeans the human, human life, like violence, exploitation, and poverty, and uh, genocide, and the terrible wars that go on even today in various nations. We stand for the dignity of every human being. And we, uh, we stand also for the existence of God, for God the creator, for God the sustainer of life, uh, and that science is a servant of God, discovering 
the wonders of creation, not a substitute for God. And we're being attacked for that too with the rise of atheism and rejection of God. We are being attacked because uh, we say that certain things are absolute, like the sanctity of innocent, innocent life can't be taken. We're being attacked um, because of our stance on these matters. Uh, because we say there are certain things that can't be changed. They are there, fixed. Fixed because God has fixed them. They are against human nature, they are against divine nature, and are wrong. We are told that all truth is relative. We are told that we make our own morality. If we choose something it's, it, and we say that's right for us, then it's right. Even if it's stealing or murder, it's, I choose it, it must be okay. There aren't any absolutes. So these currents are going around the world and we're under pressure. And he said um, that will that there, it will be difficult, as it is already in some countries, to preach the faith that we believe. And we might be jailed and imprisoned for that. We might have to suffer martyrdom for it. So we think of the martyrs that were so frequent in the early years of the church when Jesus prophesied that they, his followers would suffer. We think of the more modern martyrs in Vietnam, in Korea, uh, in Algeria, in so many parts of the world, even today, people are standing up for their faith and say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, his son, and they are being imprisoned and killed for that belief. The Pope has said, be of good courage. Jesus has overcome sin, overcome Satan, and be joyful. You have, he said, you have the truth about human dignity and you have the gift of life. Your vocation is now to show the world what you're going to do with that gift of life, how you're going to live that, dif uh, that uh, gift of life. He said, God asks you to choose how you will live that gift of life. You can live it as a follower of Jesus and be filled with joy and peace as a result. You can live it as obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and know that the Spirit lives within you and that the Spirit is love. The Holy Spirit is love and you will live a life of love. It is not to say that you will not suffer, uh, but love will be real. Love and truth, compassion, these things will rule your life. And you will know the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of a love of God within you. That is your vocation, to experience it, to live it, to express it in joyful ways as you're doing in this Congress. But also, when you go out from here, be joyful, be loving. Allow that love that's in with you, within you to radiate. I don't want to go on all night, but a few years ago I said, um, probably here, that I fully expect in a secular Europe for God to raise up great saints. I said, the devil looks as if uh, the devil's got his own way. Europe abandoning the faith of its forefathers, not just the Catholics, but the Protestants too, and they believe deeply and love Jesus. They are under pressure, and the secular society is taken uh, the, uh, the place of the religious society. I thought in a secular Europe, with secular values, with a de depleted uh, uh, respect for human life and dignity in all its forms, great saints will be raised up just as God has raised up great son saints in every age. And I can tell you that that prophecy is being fulfilled now, I keep coming across evidence of it. I travel a bit. I soon won't be traveling all that much. I'm getting older. But I come across the most amazing, extraordinary people around the world, and I hear of them too. I've just heard of a, a priest um, working in Marseille uh, who chose to work in a poor area, chose 
to wear his satan and I might tell you in Europe they sort of throw away outside uh, external um, uh, identification as priests. He wears his black satan and he goes out and he calls the prostitutes to come to Mass. He goes out and calls the Muslims to come to Mass. He goes out and gets the people in the street that haven't been to Mass for years. Come in. We, we have food to offer, the food for your spirit and love. And he preaches the love of God. And he stays in his confessional from 5 o'clock in the afternoon till 11. I don't know when he eats. But 5 o'clock in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night. Because uh, I must say, they all live at night there. Uh, so they come in from the bars and the nightclubs and the streets. And they go there because they know he's genuine. I can't say he's a saint because anyone can, can fall. But that's the sort of apostle that is God is calling up today. And there are many, many, many examples. He's a priest. But there are lay men, there are lay women who are living the gospel radically. Radically. Because the call to follow Christ is radical. Well, they are free enough to give away all that they own and just to say, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will and just live completely dependent on God's providence. We're not all called to do, go that to that extreme. We need money for our family and so forth. We need houses. But within that context, our faith must be radical and we must be ready to face whatever comes to us. It might be the beginning of a renewal of the Holy Spirit around the world. It might be the beginning of a persecution. We are not given to know that. But all I do know is that my faith is strengthened every time I see or hear or come across these modern saints out there in the harshest, harshest of elements, living a faith that is joyful, telling young people, Forget the suicide, forget the drugs. There is joy to be had. The Lord loves you. Come, come along and let's express it. So there's so much hope, so much joy in the world. So we're celebrating this year of grace, this year of faith, this year uh, of, of uh, abund abundant blessings. And it's all true. There is faith out there. There is grace in abundance and there are blessings from God in a secular war-torn torn world with terrible things happening the spirit is working working in the hearts of people and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit continue to work in your hearts and mine God bless you all